Today I'm privileged to have the former independent member for Dubbo, Dawn Fardell with me. Dawn was the independent member from 2004 to 2011. Yes, yeah, so and nothing I ever aimed for, but uh, I was approached and took a lot of decision to do it because uh, family comes first. It was very important that I had the okay of my family and um, my daughter, just my last child just finished HSC, so I was in more of a position and had more time. Yeah. Now, one of the things that I, I talk about a lot is the value of having an independent to be able to represent the community. And, and I've seen so many examples where people have told me their story and they've talked about you in glowing terms. And a lot of those conversations were small things that mightn't be significant on a big picture scale, but for that individual, what you did to, for them made an incredible difference. And I'm talking about sometimes when people might have lost a loved one, or there might have been some sort of uh, incident in their family where they needed some direct help, and they, they felt they could actually come to you and get that help. So you must have some fond memories of those. I'm, I'm not asking you to talk about specifics no, because it is hard mm. about individuals, but you must have some fond memories of really being able to help and make a difference in people's lives. Certainly, Matthew. Um, Infrastructure is important, which we delivered on in many ways, myself and the previous member. But um, those personal issues that you don't put media releases about that have affected families do affect you. And the issue always popped up on a Friday afternoon when everything was closed. But um, to be able to help those people and see them now and give warm hugs to each other and the loss they had, whether it was a, through a car accident, and the majority were affecting a, a child or domestic violence issue. Um, we, I used to walk the victim to the courthouse for the hearing, give a security for them. Gosh knows what had happened if I was attacked as well. But, um, and then, um, and also, um, uh, also another case of um, someone um, being in jail, being transferred from one part to the other, and parents had to get access and get the children to them, and um, you know, family members being deterred for a while. It's, um, it's very hard to deal with those issues, but we did. And the ministers at the time were very understanding and good helping out as well. And uh, there was one particular federal issue, but knowing people, having that network from years ago, someone who knew a federal minister, that all happened. You know? So I have great respect for many people in the bureaucracy who have to deal with that more often than I ever did. Mm, and, and I think you've hit a magic word there. Having some of those connections, having those relationships, being able to just get things done, it doesn't matter whether you're in a certain party or someone's from a different party, it's just about knowing the right person to talk to, you've established relationships with them, and then you can make things happen. Well, you're just an independent. You have to work with the gov um, government of day to get things done. You don't necessarily vote with them on every issue, um, but you have to just go ahead and uh, work with the person at the day who's the treasurer or who's the minister for health, and that's what you do. But it's very important to know their staff too, because they're the ones that do all the hard yards and, and to put the portfolio up to the minister. So uh, to getting to know that contact and networking with the staff is very important. So would it be fair to say that if you convince the, the staff, maybe the, the chief of staff, or maybe the head of that particular department, if you convince them of an idea or, or a need in an electorate, then pretty much the minister's going to sign off on it anyway. I think so. It's very important to uh, the odd uh, lazy member of parliament from all, all walks of life who might just send a letter when they have a concern from a customer. But I found it much more important to speak to the minister first or their staff, and then the letter follows. Right. And make that initial contact, and it saves a lot of time in the process. So we've heard lots of stories, or I have anyway, on the, on the campaign trail about individual things we've helped, but it wasn't just about that. I think you made a significant difference in well, the yes. six and a half years you spent in Parliament. There were some major wins that, that you had as well. So what were some of your fondest memories of some of those victories? There, there might have been infrastructure, it might have been significant investment, or significant planning for this overall electorate. Yes, I think so. And my first priority was to complete the three things outstanding from Tony McGrain, which was uh, the transfer of the Crown land for the PCYC, that I was heavily involved with myself in the past, getting that up and going. Um, and also there was the uh, Fairview Heights Street block of land that was deteriorated and the pool run down, and speaking to the Minister for Education and getting that sold with the proceeds to go back into um, infrastructure or something positive in our community, because the money for that facility was raised by the community, the West Haven School and the pool, so it was very important that that money could stay in Dubbo, and that was agreed to, and that went through a smart board to every classroom in Dubbo primary right. schools. Yep. So, so that, that was that wonderful. that money directly Public from schools. Fairview yes. didn't go back into the state coffers per se, it went in, back into Dubbo schools. Yeah. And it was a cohesive agreement between all the principals of the school and the director here at the time. They all agreed on one issue that one principal put up that was needed. I think they had one or two at the school, but allowed for... Um, a smart board to go into every school, so that was a very good thing to finish off. Mm. And the other was the Dubbo Police Station, which was a very hot potato at the issue at the time. Um, Tony McGrain had identified the, the need for it, they were looking for sites, so then I had to pick up the rod then um, uh, 
after Tony's death and I was elected to then find, make sure we did find a hot suitable site, which we did. And then the next process is getting the plans and getting the budget because you can't go to the bank to build a new house. Like I, you know, I've, I've wanted a certain amount of money until actually quotes are done and plans are done, locations done. Hmm. And that's what, when you hear a lot of promises now from a lot of politicians. A promise is all very well, but uh, a colourful member of parliament told me once, don't get excited and make an announcement until the contract's signed. Yeah. So I always remember that, but it's all that groundwork behind, which sometimes can take three, four years to get it into the process and then get that police station into the budget which happened and that was Tony McGrain's I feel a bit more peace for him knowing that those three issues he would have liked to have been finished yeah. and, yes. and certainly and I was on council during that process when some of those things were happening so I will remember in particular Fairview and, and Paul Loxley who was involved in the education department yes. was on council with me as well so I remember those discussions around the smart mm. boards and Paul was very excited about the work that you did to actually get smart boards across the schools in Dubbo so they're the sort of things that I think when you're in touch with the local community you can have an impact so that was taking care of, of Tony's legacy yeah. to a certain extent and then you continued on obviously you didn't wash your hands and say that's it my job's done now no. you continued on basically advocating for things in the community and so some of those things that, that come to mind for you from your perspective you know what are some of those other things that you saw that you could achieve and start to put in plans in place for after that well certainly the hospital um, announcement was made very early on in my tenure that um, Dubbo Base Hospital was going to go ahead and I'd not heard anything about it but um, it appears that someone might put out a wrong media release and it was Lithgow. But that got me on the go then because I come out welcome such an announcement not knowing the process newly into the job. But anyway I decided well, what about Dubbo? So we, we had uh, a look at that and I remember um, we got to say uh, Premier Yemma was in and the Mayor at the time was Alan Smith and we went down to a meeting and uh, to meet with him and I had previously spoken to one of his advisors that we needed to have a study on the need for that for here because the doctor had told me, a specialist in, in Dubbo had told me that uh, when they did looked at Orange, they just put a circumference on the map and took, it took in Penrith and everywhere else. So, uh, and that's great for Orange if they've had improvements down there as well. We all need it. Yeah. So we did a big, they put money aside, put a study and come back to me, gee, you're right, Dawn. So it took us a few years to a bit more work happened and carried on. And uh, prior to, uh, back in 2010, the first set of plans were actually drawn up, um, initial plans, and there was media, and uh, everyone agreed on these are great plans. And I remember saying to the, um, uh, the fellows from the planning section at the time, the government that were there, if the government had the money tomorrow, how long would it take? And they said six years. But of course, things aren't that simple. It took a bit longer than that. And it's still got ongoing, and we still need to see that ongoing but identify the need. And I remember even the late Jerry Peacock come out and he said, uh, he was asked about my announcements about the hospital and beating the drum. And even he, I remember he was clearly saying that yes, he should have identified that. You know, so it's something now that's happened and I feel glad with that. And um, no, I've been run down, I didn't get the money for it. Well, it was nowhere near the money stage. Only the first set of plans have been drawn up and then we had an election, of course, and, um, and the National Party took over the seat. So I'm very pleased with that. And another thing I was pleased with was Ms Guaz were owing money around town and um, I think the member for Barwon put it out there that the butcher in Gulgandra was owed money and that was right. And then I thought, well, hang on, if he's owed money, who else is owed money? So I got up to $21 million I was owing. And then um, following, that's a long story I know, but following that, um, uh, a little bird came into my office and whispered in my ear, they knew someone who said it was $64 million. Wow. So the Minister for Health acknowledged that when I approached them and they fixed up that situation. But unfortunately, that was the cost then of uh, improvements to uh, Parks and Forbes Hospital went out the way because you just can't pick out $64 million out the air. But it was very important that all the people in the area had been paid their bills mm. and that um, that's what we delivered on that. So no, it wasn't infrastructure, but the people who owed that amount of money, total that amount of money in uh, this area, their debts were cleared. And that, mm. that really was just mismanagement yes, of, of the Greater Western Area Health Service at the time. Yes, I think so too, and um, I'm pleased that happened. It was a terrible thing to have to deal with. So uh, that was one thing I'm pleased we did, but unfortunately it meant that the $40 million was earmarked for, for Parks and uh, $20 million for Forbes had to be put a bit side a bit longer. Yeah. Mm. And, and certainly related to the hospital, I remember that you started off the process with Lillian Brady for Macquarie Homestay. Now, we saw Macquarie Homestay just opened mm. uh, a couple of weeks ago. You were there at the opening with, with me and, and obviously a number of other people. But that must have been exciting for you as well, that an idea sitting down chatting to, to Lillian, Lillian, Mayor of Cobar, of course, outside your electorate. But again, you understood full well, as I did when I was Mayor, 
the Dubbo relies on the region so much, so it doesn't matter the line on the map that that's says right. here's the electoral boundary, it, Dubbo relies on the region, and the region relies on Dubbo. So having that discussion with Lillian started off a process that came to fruition only a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, it started with Lillian and also with Elizabeth, who was also uh, at the time at a meeting we had um, with people from Orange wanting us to contribute, um, uh, get Dubbo community contributing to the facility at Orange, which is a wonderful facility down there. But then uh, Elizabeth and I said, well, Dubbo could do that. So that's when we started and I formed a committee and, um, and those same people were on it right the other day were all at the opening yeah. on that committee and it's wonderful what they have done to achieve. Usually we're just looking at maternity but now it goes a lot more than that and we need to know that, that it's not just about, Dubbo must be included. Yeah. Our Dubbo Mayor and Council should be involved and help support all the others because the people that spend money here, it's phenomenal. If you sell a raffle ticket downtown Saturday morning, hardly anyone goes to uh, the addresses Dubbo. Yeah, yeah, Very important right. we support each other. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and you see that with the hospital with 50% of the emissions coming from outside 2830 and that's a, a constant theme. Even the theatre, when we built the theatre in Dubbo, then we were finding about 32% of people that were buying tickets to the theatre were outside 2830. So it, it really is a hub for the entire area, so it is important. So moving off the hospital for a moment, Moving on the Newell Highway, obviously the Newell Highway has been an important transport link for, for many years now, and including during your time, and again, I think you did a bit of work around that. Yeah, so it was back in, um, just looking the other day, back in April 2009, that um, was a date we set. Uh, I don't know if I was getting complaints and industry were coming to me, the trucking industry, about the number of incidents on the road, the lack of rest stops, uh, no overtaking lanes, even between lanes, even between Dubbo and Parks, and I travelled often to there and Balls. It was a terrible road to travel on, and a lot of work's been doing on, on the Pacific Highway and Princess Highway, which is also needed, but nothing about the Newell. And I noticed in an RMA journal that there was task force with the other two highways, but Newell Highway didn't have a task force. So I invited every mayor from the border, from Victoria and up to the Queensland border, that the Newell went through to attend a meeting. So again, these are these are areas way outside your electorate, but yeah, that's you saw right. the way to solve a problem in your electorate was to go outside the It wasn't the just about my particular area, that's right. And I thought we need to go further than that and get all the support, because if we had needs, they certainly had needs as well. And uh, when you're in the member, it's not you're just representing Dubbo, where you live, you're representing all New South Wales. I've even happened to vote on the Lane Cove Tunnel issue many years ago in Parliament, because you're represented to vote on issues affecting all New South Wales. Mm. But we invited all the NRMA, um, the opposition came, we had the Minister, who's now Michael Daly's Premier, he was a Minister for Roads at the time, and uh, surprised me with a $30 million cheque to kickstart it. Right. which was wonderful and the local administration in uh, Parkes at the time thought that was great. That's what they needed to kickstart the program back in 2009 yeah. and to identify and then from the New Highway Task Force was formed from that. Uh, the late Robert Wilson uh, hosted the initial meeting for us and after that um, the Mayor of Parks took over the lead and Parks more or less did all the secretarial work for it. Right. I used to go to the meetings while I was a member but when I wasn't re-elected I went to one after and then you know you have to hand the plate over, the, hand the, um, the turnover. The turnover and I did that. Yeah. So um, that was very um, important that that continued. Um, I hope it's still continuing. There's been a re-announcement recently of some money for the Newell. Um, I don't think it's in the budget getting allocated, so you've got to be careful when you do that. But I'm ha happy that, to think that um, people are still interested yeah. and I think an in another independent such as yourself can help deliver that. We still need to keep delivering. Yeah. Um, well, what a great example though yeah. of, of someone just identifying a need, taking action and then the government of the day, whoever the government of the day is, cannot help but see when there's a need that their job is to govern for the entire state. So they've got to come and respond to that. So really what I see from the action you took there in creating that task force was you created a need and the government of the day had to respond to that and, and obviously... And I think the most uh, thing I'm proud of is I've never put all my mates on anything. You know, like with the... With the um with the Macquarie homestay was a mixture of people. I knew probably two thirds never ever would think of voting for me, you know, but yeah. I knew they were the right person at the time to do that. And the same with the Newell Highway Task Force. It was a, a mixture of people there. But it's great to think that, um, and someone once said that I had the, the gift of being able to form, identify the need, put the right people in place, and just keep in contact with them and make sure it was progressing. Yeah. And I think you need to do that. And the funding comes through. And, and to be able to work with, um, government and people who are different political persuasions get something done, only an independent can do. And a true independent, I don't think an independent, uh, you're not independent if you belong to a previous party or any other party. Mm. A true independent is one who's never belonged to a political party in my eyes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. No, look, it's, it has been fascinating and I, and I love hearing stories from your time and I've talked to you obviously not just yeah, now yeah. In, in front of the camera but I've talked to you a lot about some of your successes and some of the things that, that you wouldn't 
talk about publicly, obviously, but it is fascinating to see what you can achieve in independent, but most importantly, you can represent the electorate in the way it deserves to be represented, not in the way that someone else, i.e. a party, tells you you must represent an area. Yes, I used to um, I think, you know, a lot of people who are very good in business in town, they know how to help themselves or where to go. But it's really the coffee talk and the pub talk. They're the people who are hurting, and I think it's very important to keep your feet on the ground and listen to the people who run the, the bottom of the rung in a, a career or whatever it might be. They're the ones who have to struggle to get to the top or to keep living and the cost of living and, and flat power and everything else. All those issues that are affecting us all now. Mm. But I think with the political parties are exploding at the moment and, um, you know, and, uh, it's a throwaway line here, but perhaps we should put it, um, the Governor General should take over the administration for four years and clean it all out, put all independence in for four years. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you certainly get a positive for me for that. I think, uh, I think 93 independence in State Parliament would be, would be very good. <laughs> I think so. Keep all the parties out them, let them sort themselves out as the banks are now doing, yep. and then they come back and track it four years' time, and uh, the cream of the independence will rise to the top. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's always fascinating to talk to you, Dawn. I appreciate your time and I appreciate the support. It's, it's great to have you sitting there giving me advice and support along the way because, uh, again, you, you just can't knock the experience that someone like yourself has and, and I always love to listen to the experience. It doesn't mean you have to follow what someone else has done, but, but in my mind, it's, it's always sensible to listen to people that have, that have gone down that same path before and just learn from that experience. So yes. thank you for your time today and thank you for your, for your help over the last six or so months and I'm sure it'll be continuing on as we go forward. It's been a pleasure working with you, Matthew. All right, thanks, Tom. Bye.